We turn to take our text this morning from the portion of Scripture that we read together from the first book of the Chronicles, the 21st chapter, and we shall read for our text the verse number 16. First Chronicles 21 and the verse 16. And David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven, having a drawn sword in his hand stretched out over Jerusalem. Then David and the elders of Israel, who were clothed in sackcloth, fell upon their faces. In this verse we are confronted with a, a very sobering picture. Here was a sight which was enough to cause fear into any man's heart. You remember in the scriptures, in many a place, it has been that the angel of the Lord has appeared to one and brought good tidings to one. And yet what fear there has been accompanying the presence of the angel. That was with good tidings. Now here is one bringing grievous tidings with a sorrowful work to do amongst the people. How much greater was the fear of this sight. How much more of an alarming sight was this to see this angel of the Lord standing with a drawn sword out of its sheath, ready to do its work over the city of Jerusalem. In this portion, David has been brought to the kingdom. He is ruling over Israel and Judah. The united a place as it was then, before the nations were properly divided for good as it were. David has been quite established. We read just in the chapter 21 how that the nation was going forth and was conquering the various nations and how they were destroyed, how they were brought into subjection. David is being established and becoming great in this kingdom. And now, even as he is growing, as he is becoming the stronger, Satan stands up against him and provokes him. It is one matter which must be considered for a growing church. If a church was to be in a condition where it was growing, where it was becoming stronger, it must expect that Satan will stand in the way and will cause them to err, if he possibly can. And ultimately, it is only by the grace of God that any are kept. But he stands up with this temptation, which seems to be so innocuous. It seems so perfectly probable. He is becoming stronger. It is a very legitimate thing, perhaps, you might think for him to do. And yet, being contrary to the command of God, it is a sin to David to commit this. It is not a sin in other places in Scripture to number the people. In other places we read of it taking place, and it is even commanded of the Lord. But for David in this place, here was a sin that was so grievous in the sight of God. It was a direct contradiction to God, as it were, because here we see pride rising up in David's heart. This was not motivated because God had commanded that the people should be numbered, but this was motivated because David, seeing his expansion of his realm, as it were, seeing his military success that his nation was having, he desires to know how strong he is, how well he is built up. And in, the, in this pride he is caused by Satan to sin. Satan often comes to us in this way. He lifts us up with pride and so brings us down by that treacherous means which creeps into our hearts, and we might almost consider at times as though it is constantly present in our hearts, this deadly pride, constantly standing by us, never leaving us for one moment, but always seeking to bring us down. And so deadly it is. It's been the ruin of many a good man. But this, this has come upon him, and David realizes afterwards, though he is challenged by Joah, Remarkably, that wicked man, Joab, he challenges him and tries to prevent him from accomplishing this purpose. But he does not succeed, and so he goes about and he numbers the people. But God smites Israel. 
and David sees that he has sinned. But he must nonetheless have a punishment. And this punishment must not merely affect David, but it must affect all the people who are under him. And here we see something of the great responsibility of those who have any position in leadership. They fall into iniquity, they fall into sin. The effect of it, the punishment of it, the chastisement from the hand of God because of it, may well fall upon them. It may well affect the family. It may well affect the church. It may well affect the nation in those particular three spheres over which men have the rulership. It's a great responsibility. And so all the people are punished in a way for this. And God gives to David the three options that we read in verse 12. Three years of famine, three years being destroyed by their foes, or three days. The, angel, the sword of the Lord, the pestilence in the land. And David falls into the hand of the Lord. And the pestilence falls upon all the people. And then we read of this wonderful point. The angel of the Lord is sent by God to Jerusalem to destroy it. And as he is destroying in Jerusalem, capital city, the Lord beheld. And he determined that it was enough. And he commanded the angel to stay. Well, we see here two principal doctrines as we commence. The first being, the justice of God must always be met. God, being entirely just, being wholly righteous and perfect in righteousness, as the ruler of the world, he must needs see to it that there is a just punishment for every crime that is committed. It cannot be that any sin in this world can go unpunished. And according to his sovereignty, so he meets out, whether in this world or to the next, according to his sovereignty, that which is deserved to every man for his sins. It may be in some cases that there will be those, and this has often perplexed many a believer, those who prosper in this world, who seem to do so well in this world, who seem to have no affliction come upon them for their sins. And yet there are some, we see, who are cut off before their time, who are led perhaps to run to such an excess of their sin that they eventually destroy themselves in their iniquity, or those who are in some spectacular way cut off before their time by the intervention of the Almighty, by some unforeseen event taking place, which cuts their lives short. But whether it is in this life, when man has a chance to observe it, or whether it is in the next life, in hell, all sin must be punished. The justice of God must somehow be satisfied by some means. Not just in part, but in full. There will never be a case, for this is an impossibility with God, there is such a thing, that sin can be simply, as we say, swept under the carpet. It is impossible with God that sin can be overlooked. It must be dealt with. Justice must be done. It demands it. The very nature of God demands it. And it would be contrary to the whole being of God if it were not to be so. If it were not to fall out in such a way in the world that justice must be met. But the second doctrine is this, that we see also from this portion and particularly from the text. The sword of justice, as we see it, the justice of God, is in the Lord's hand and it is suspended over every man in this world until such a time as it is right for it to fall, except it by, be stayed by some means. This dramatic picture 
the angel of the Lord, a messenger from heaven, is standing over Jerusalem with the sword which is out of its sheath, and it is there. It is over that city. It is condemning that city. It is a testimony against that city. It is a witness against it. And that sword, if the Lord had not stayed it, would in due course have fallen. It should have fallen and destroyed that city and leveled it to the ground, as it were, so far as the inhabitants were concerned. But the Lord stayed it. And it is possible. The justice may be diverted from falling upon wretched man. And it may be diverted in the providence and sovereignty of God that it may fall upon the Son of God for those who believe in his name, for his chosen people, that sword of justice. We may be spared from feeling it upon us in the fullest sense. Well, if we proceed briefly through this text then, we see certain things with these two doctrines in mind. First of all, we see how that David lifts up his eyes to see this great sight. He has already come to this point where he has realized he has sinned. And yet, now he lifts up his eyes and sees perhaps a more frightening sight than all this before. And maybe he has heard of the effects of the pestilence. He has seen those who are dying of it. He has seen the bodies of those who have passed from this world and been taken away because of it. And yet now he sees quite another sight altogether. Now he sees a clear vision of the one who is inflicting this upon the people. The angel of the Lord himself. My friends, we may observe here how that understanding and enlightenment comes from the Lord. He lifted up his eyes. This is a phrase often used in the scriptures for various matters and in various circumstances. And yet, my friends, when we lift up our eyes, it is to look upon something in a very plain and ordinary sense. And yet here he is looking towards God. He is looking towards the messenger of God. And my friends, when such a sight is before our eyes, when we see ourselves, how that by nature this sword of justice is suspended over our heads, it is as it were as though our heads were on the block. The executioner has the axe in his hand, and it is suspended over one. That is our state by nature. When we lift up our eyes, it can only be a good thing in this case. Because, my friends, so often we are asleep on the block. Our heads are on the block, but we are fast asleep. And it is such the case with many in this world today. In a dire position. In the city of Jerusalem, and yet unaware that this sword is hanging over them. Unaware of the danger that they are in unaware that at any moment, at God's command, destruction should sweep through their midst and they should be cut off without remedy. And yet this is the condition of every man by nature, because he has sinned and the justice of God demands that there must be a punishment. He lifts up his eyes then. How can we do the same? By looking to God. It is a great fault of men these days that they do not call upon God. It's been a great fault of men in days past also for this same cause, because men do not call upon God. Do I mean to say that their fault is that they don't go to church? They don't engage in the prayers? Yes, I do. But in a sense, more than that, that alone will not save them. They may not call upon God, though they may be in the church and they may hear through their ears a prayer being said. But rather we mean they must pray themselves in their own hearts. It is very possible for a minister to pray from a pulpit and be the only person in the building who is praying. My friends, it is not just listening to prayers that helps. 
In these times, you can now get applications where you can listen to prayers being read out, which are supposed to help with meditation and to help you to get closer to God. My friends, that is not praying. That is not calling on the Lord. That is not lifting up your eyes to see your state and to see what God requires of you. There must be a calling upon the Lord in the truest sense, in an informed sense, and therefore an understanding and a reading of the Scriptures. It is necessary that a man should read the Word of God, that he, he should see therein his state. What do the Scriptures principally teach? So the Catechism question runs. Two things. He, they teach what God would desire man to know about himself. And they teach what duty God requires of man. My friends, that is all man needs to know in this world, fundamentally. And yet if he lift not up his eyes to see these things, then what hope has he in the world? He has ignored his maker's commands. His nature is corrupted in every faculty that he cannot comprehend it of himself but he must needs have a revelation. You remember the Apostle Peter. When he makes that wonderful confession of Christ, of who he is, that Christ says to him, flesh and blood hath not told you this, but the Father hath revealed it to you. So it is, my friends. But here is the revelation of God. This is what is to be sought out. For in this book, we see the angel of the Lord. It reveals to every man his condition with this sword upon, over his head, as it were. Justice. The sword of the Lord. Over him. But if he read not this book, he will not know of this. My friends, he has a testimony. Natural man has a testimony that there is a God. Principally, because he can see that there is a God in the works of creation, he can see that there is a God in the works of providence, and he can tell that there is a God because of the testimony of his own conscience. But none of those three things tell him what he must do about it. None of these three things tell him or give him any instruction as to the seriousness of his condition on their own, and none of them give him an indication of anything save the fact that he ought to seek out this God who he knows to exist. And so we have, in many lands, so many false religions, so many people who try to find this God who they know from creation and providence and from their own conscience. And they go about all sorts of different ways to find out this God and to know this God. And yet here is his word. Here is the book which he has given to man. And this we must seek to put to the people and to give to the people. They must look to the Lord first of all then for their help. They must look to the Lord to see their condition. And they must look to the Lord to see their remedy from it. David lifted up his eyes to see his condition to see the state of Jerusalem, to see what was impending upon it. So, my friends, must you consider your own hearts. Consider what state you are in before God. Consider what position this sword of justice is in over you, whether it has been sheathed with the blood of Christ or whether it is yet a naked blade over your head. Consider this matter. Lift up your eyes. Look to the Lord. And my friends, consider what your state is before him. David lifted up his eyes and saw the angel of the Lord stand between the earth and the heaven. This angel of the Lord then, oftentimes this phrase is used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, we find a number of cases where it is undisputably so used. I do not believe it is so used here. I do believe that this was, if we can say, an ordinary angel. Nonetheless, 
one who came from the heavenly courts, one who came from the presence of God, God himself, one who had something of the glory of God about his person, a heavenly being, fresh as it were, from thence, and therefore having something of the glory and the majesty of God about it, not a fallen angel, note, in this destruction, but rather one which was perfect, one which was holy, and one which upheld the standards of justice, of its maker and of its master, God Almighty. I do not say that this would be incongruent with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ in this case, however. There would be those, especially today, who would consider that this would be very contrary to the nature of Jesus Christ. So many have a conception of Christ as being, as the hymn says of him as a child, meek and mild, so gentle, so feeble and so weak, and yet so merciful and so kind to everyone. And yet they see not how that Jesus Christ, though fully man, was yet fully God. And as fully God, he must necessarily have the same standards of justice and holiness and perfection, the same requirements that justice be meted out. It would be incongruent to his person if he were not in accordance with this. And if it were not even proper for Christ himself to be in such a position. This is beside the point, nonetheless. But when an angel of the Lord appears on the earth, there is always a message to be given. There is always something that is brought deliberately to a person. Angels do not appear randomly, but they always have a deliberate message to bring, and therefore a deliberate revelation to be given to that person to whom they are sent, to whom they come. And thus of old, it was often that the people of God were instructed, and they were taught of special and particularly singular events which would take place. Now I will observe here how that angels are not seen in this form today. Why? The, the principal task of the angel was to be a messenger from God. This is what the word means. The angel, a messenger. Therefore, they must bring a message. For an angel to appear, there must be a word from the Lord which is brought in a plain and must be brought in a, a special manner. But, my friends, we have a complete canon of Scripture. We have a book which tells to us that if any man add to it or take away from it, then they are to be cursed, they are to be punished, they to be, are, are to be judged, and from thence we determine that it is a grievous sin to add to Scripture. Now, will God go against his own word? It cannot be so. God cannot add to it, not now. He has given to us a complete revelation. Sure, we shall know much more in the next life. When we reach glory, when we arrive in heaven, sure, our eyes shall be opened to so many greater and more wonderful things, if by the grace of Jesus Christ we attain thence. But you see here, revelation in this world is complete. There is nothing more to be added. And therefore we shall not see an angel in our days coming into this world. There will be no message to bring. We have the Holy Scriptures. Every believer has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them. And the Spirit is operative at large in the world, where and when the Lord will be pleased for him to work. And so he will appear to men in their souls, not to their eyes, and will reveal to them the things of God. Nonetheless, these things are given for our instruction that we may learn from them, that we may see from them a more graphic picture, as it were, and a very visual representation of the things of God to our minds. And they help us to understand the nature of God. And we respect that this is how God was pleased to work in times past. Notice also the position of this angel. He was standing between the earth and the heaven. It is a curious thing that is often commented, and I think very properly, 
of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ, that there he was on the cross, suspended between the earth and the heaven. On that occasion, we see that that was a very visual picture of how Christ was rejected by the world and he was rejected, as it were, by heaven. The Father's back was turned upon him for that while because he would not look upon his Son because while he bore our sins upon the tree. Of course, this was a principle in some ways, if you had to put a religious principle on crucifixion. It suspended one between the earth and the heaven, rejected of both. We see it in a special way concerning Christ. But here we see it reversed. Suspended between the earth and heaven, the angel of the Lord, showing how that God, who was yet in heaven, has a hand in everything and has sovereignty and complete sway over all that takes place in the earth. Not rejection from both on the part of the angel, but rather a unification of both under the control and command of his master who sent him. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout all the earth. The Lord ordains all things that have taken come to take place in the earth. The Lord knows all that will take place in the earth. And the Lord has power to change all things that take place in the earth. It ought to be mentioned, the Lord will never change his mind about anything. We read in that verse just before, the Lord in verse 15, we read, he repented him of the evil. This was not a change of mind. This was a fixed determination in his mind. And yet to man, it must be revealed such. And in such a way as this, God is unchanging. We believe this absolutely. He cannot repent him of anything that he has been done in the sense that we would consider the word, in the way that we would use the term as a change of mind, a change of thought, a change of heart to go on a different way. But this is a very different sense. The Lord determined now, at this point, that it would be enough. Hither shalt thou come and no further, as he has set bounds to the sea. So his angels are at his command. So it was determined that the angel should go no further, but that the destruction should cease there, and this sight should be revealed to David's eyes, the angel there with the sword. Between the earth and the heaven, though, it shows the Lord's sovereignty, his sway over all the earth, but do we not also see here something of the conflict and the comparison which is between justice and mercy? Do we not see here also how that though justice may have stood with her fiery sword in her hand over the people between the heaven and the earth, so Christ himself shed his blood in the same position? Justice was satisfied in that case, and there surely the finest case of all. Justice was satisfied, and yet so also was mercy. There in Christ, as the sins of his people were borne by him upon the cross, justice and mercy were united together. Here was a way that the justice of God should not fall upon all men in the world. And so mercy was satisfied that the glory of God should be shown and displayed and made manifest in the salvation of some from this justice, from the wrath of God falling upon them. He being, of course, the pinnacle of God's creation, the highest of all the creatures. And yet herein justice was also satisfied. Their sins did not go unpunished. They were not left merely as for corruption in this world. They were not left to be poured out upon the man. But as it were, Christ made the way for mercy to be expressed by the Almighty. He made the way open that grace might flow freely to the sons of men. So it is we see then here a wonderful comparison 
here in the position of this angel. But this drawn sword in his hand, we have spoken already of how justice must have its full punishment. My friends, here was a painful matter. It was a drawn sword. It had one purpose, one intention, and that was destruction. This is all a drawn sword is ever used for. It is a weapon designed for warfare. And a weapon designed to be effective in the same. My friends, so is the sword of the justice of God. If it is not sheathed, if it is not met by something, if it is not satisfied by something, then is due a terrible end. Then is due such as is not worthy, even something we can think of, or should think of, without shuddering. So fearful is that end. Not annihilation, we reject that completely. But rather, eternity of torment. You see, all this, it seems a bit much. David has sinned such an... Uh, it did not even appear in many cases to be a sin. It is something which doesn't appear to be of itself a wrong thing to do. Yet, my friends, so things that seem to us not to be particularly wrong can be made sin to us. They can be made to us, perhaps due to a misuse or an overuse of a certain thing. It may be that it is made sin to us, and therefore a grievous sin, as all sin is grievous before God. Our very smallest sins, most insignificant sins, since perhaps that we do not even realize that we are committing every day, every hour, one of those, just one, would be sufficient for the justice of God to mete out a punishment upon us which would last for eternity. This is a weighty matter, not just a nice pretty picture, not just a story for the little children, but here is a solemn reality which is portrayed in this very graphic image, in this text. Well, what do we have in the way of application from these things this morning? We come to close with a few words on this. First of all, if such is man's natural state before God, if man is in such a condition before his Maker, does it not behove us to also lift up our eyes as David did here? Does it not behove us to seek out the Maker's commands? Does it not behove us to search out until we find the Maker himself and come before him in a proper way as instructed? My friends, this should encourage us and indeed instruct us in the way of reading the Scriptures. Not merely as any other book, not merely just reading them because it is a duty to read them, but reading them with a purpose, reading them deliberately, reading them to know the will of the Maker, reading them desiring to see what God counts to be sin, reading them what to see what God would have us to do, what is man's duty towards his Maker, reading them to see the holiness of God and the solemnity of our case, and constantly reading them that we forget not these things. This is a duty behoven to us. And further, the duty of meditation upon the Word of God. Duty of considering those things that are read therein, in our own minds, and thinking them through for ourselves, and praying over them, praying that the Lord would open our eyes, that he would not just grant to us that we might lift up our lives and eyes and our hearts to him, but further that we might indeed render to him that which is due to his name. It teaches us that we must diligently seek God in the scriptures in the way appointed, and further that we should come before him, seeking him in the scriptures, reading therein of the sinfulness of man, that we should fall before him. We read here, David, the elders of Israel, clothed in sackcloth, they fall upon their faces. 
there is a right and proper response in us. Because we as sinners, <clears throat> as we read the scriptures, would do well to fall before the Lord in this way. Because this is the natural condition. If the Spirit is so pleased to work in us, as we read the word of God, such a holy awe will be impressed upon us that we will be brought to this state, falling down before the Lord. This indicates to us humanity, casting off all confidence in the flesh, casting off all of our church going to save us, and seeking him alone for the only way of salvation. Turning away from all of our own pride in this world, turning away from all of our confidence in self to be able to provide, turning away from all of the worship of self, the self-seeking that we are so prone to, even as Christian people, and falling before him, and owning him as the only Lord God, the only name under heaven which is worthy to be worshipped. Further than this, we see how that we ought to engage upon the duty which is behoven upon all men everywhere. That is the duty of repentance. Being in such a condition before God, to come before him in such a way Acknowledging we have sinned, confessing to him all our faults before him, and this not just merely in a saving sense, not merely at conversion, but my friends, it is the duty of all men everywhere. Not all men everywhere shall be saved, not all men everywhere shall ever do this, and yet it is behoven upon them. It is a duty of man, just merely for being man, that he should repent of his sins. So it is for us, though, as Christian people, to be constantly in this condition, or always. We should not be pro right Christians, according to the apostolic tradition, if we were constantly grieving over sin. We are to rejoice. Yet there are seasons appointed, as Solomon says, for each of these things. We must make certain that they each have their proper seasons. None of these are neglected, and yet each is given due attention. But this principal matter here, concerning conversion. But further than this, now we look back upon this, we see how that justice and the sword of justice fell at Calvary on Jesus Christ. Yet one who is in such a condition as this, who is upon the ground, who is burdened by sin, yet there is a plea for such, that is Jesus Christ. And thence Christ may be found. This sword, it has been taken out of its sheath upon Calvary for some such who will believe upon his name. My friends, has fallen upon Christ instead of his people. Therefore there must be some who shall be saved. And they shall only be ever saved by pleading Christ himself before the throne of God. My friends, that is the plea which must be made. You feel under such a condition. You see this great sight. My friends, Christ, he can bear that sword of justice on your behalf, if you will believe upon his name. And for all those who do believe, you have been spared from this. As it were, this sword has been deflected. It has been turned from its course. As it fell to descend upon us, so Christ came in for us. And taking that sword, he brought it to bear upon himself. And voluntarily, he offered himself for our sakes. My friends, what a debt of love we owe to Christ. Not just to go on now. We may be saved, but to go further than this. Not just merely to rest content that this sword is not falling upon us, it is not raised over our heads. But we see also here David he comes now to Ornan and he purchases the threshing floor and he purchases these things. We read there in verse 24, he will not take that which is thine for the Lord he will not offer burnt offerings without cost. So, my friends, it ought to be for us. We cannot, in view of this, live our lives without paying any price. 
to Christ without paying anything to him for all that he has rendered for us. And so seeing this, we must go on. We must offer burnt offerings and meat offerings, offerings of a sweet savour unto the Lord. And yet, as you recall, the burnt offering was one of those which was to consume all. There was to be nothing left. So is the Christian to be before Christ, as servants of Christ, to be wholly consumed in his service, burnt up with a love towards him, all our faculties and abilities used for him, for his glory. And so to continue on, seeing what a glorious salvation it is that we have, seeing how great it is, truly, in Christ Jesus, and seeing something of what he wore for us upon Calvary's tree. My friends, I must plead with you this morning to consider your standing. Lift up your eyes. Behold something of God. Consider your state before him. Christ, he came to save sinners. He came into the world to save those who would call upon his name. And if you feel yourself to be a sinner this morning, then you are singularly qualified to call upon his name. My friends, whether or not you have done it before, whether you have ever approached before the throne of grace, even come boldly this morning, everyone, and call upon his name. And you will find relief and great joy therein, comfort in confessing your sins and seeing this wonderful salvation in Jesus Christ. Well, may the Lord bless these things to our souls this morning, for Christ's sake. Amen.